After all the setup, we have finally come to the first numbered issues of Nightfall, covering Batman issues number 192 and 193, with Detective Comics issues 659 in between. Batman issues are all written by Doug Mensch, um, with issue 492 lettered by Richard Starkings, pre-comic craft. The Detective Comics issue is written by Chuck Dixon. The last three issues... Um, I should say all three issues have art by Norm Brayfogle and colors by Adrienne Roy, with the last two issues being lettered by Tim Harkins. All three issues are edited by Scott Peterson, Jordan B. Gornfickle, and the legendary Denny O'Neill. Batman 492 opens with the Mad Hunter breaking it had a breaking a chimpanzee who knows him out of the Gotham Zoo. In the Batcave, Batman and Robin are looking at a display of all the inmates who have escaped from Gotham. Black Mask is on the list, so I'm assuming that they're including people who are already on the lam um, and are thus still a possible threat as well. Back with Hatter, his chimp manages to catch one of Bird's falcons and puts a radio tag on him. After that, the Hatter breaks into a haberdasher to get some supplies and leave a message. At GCPD, Bullock and Montoya are both bemoaning their own board of escaped inmates, which appears in this case also to be set up as something of a reference to homicide life on the street, whose first season was this year. The do suspect that there is a plan at work, they just don't know whose plan and why, and that worries them. At the haberdasher, the Batmobile pulls up, and Batman and Robin very quickly find an invite to a tea party from the Mad Hatter, and speed off so to be not so not to be late for a very important date. During all of this, Batman is watching coverage of the breakout on TV, with particular commentary by Dr. Flanders, a pop psychologist who basically claims that the Arkham inmates are all harmless and only Batman makes them dangerous. On the one hand, this is a very common depiction of, cop, of uh, pop psychology from the time, and it's a presentation in real life that hasn't gone away. This Dr. Flanders, who we'll also later learn... Um, has his first name of Simpson, in case the shout-out wasn't already obvious, um, has not too far off from, say, Dr. Phil. The depiction also feels like something for a rebuttal of some of the criticism of Batman's rogues galleries, Batman being a guy who just beats up the poor and the mentally ill, with, when, with a few exceptions which we'll get to when we come to them, and they will come up in this. Um, a lot of the members of Batman's Rogues Gallery don't have any real mental disabilities or disorders. They just behave outside of what we consider normal and in a violent manner. This also helps get across the idea that Arkham isn't actually, as far as the asylum, isn't actually trying to help people, at least not the people running it, not the people who are taking the high-profile cases. It's like a dark form of celebrity medicine. The high-profile doctors, the ones who throw their weight around to get the high-profile cases assigned to Arkham, your Jokers, your Scarecrows, your Victor Freeze, all of them, and who want to control their care, aren't trying to help people learn um, live with their neurodivergence without hurting other people. They aren't even necessarily trying to make people well in the traditional medical sense of considering neurodivergence as a thing to be diagnosed and cured. They want to make themselves famous. And the way to do that is to create some exciting new diagnosis for some high-profile, super-violent, super-criminal, super-villain like the Joker or Scarecrow. To pull this another way, Four years before this story came out, Silence of the Lambs was released, and a whole bunch of viewers who hadn't seen Michael Mann's film Manhunter were exposed to the character of Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter is a person who behaves in a manner that is not considered normal. He eats people. But we see over the course of that film that he can pass for normal easily, and indeed he's very cultured and a good conversationalist who would also eat your face if he felt like it. But medically... Does that, does the cannibalism, is that what makes, is that a diagnosable mental disorder? Now, I admit I am not a psychologist. I am neurodivergent. I have autism. But I would reasonably say that aside from sociopathy, um, cannibalism itself does not necessarily fall into the DSM. And that's where the whole thing of Batman 
beats up the mentally ill becomes a problematic statement because by using the ableism as a context of the criticism, this criticism of Batman, you are instead perpetuating a different ableist idea. That being mentally disabled, dysfunctional, or neurodivergent makes you violent. Again, as a person with autism, and is aware of how this under how the the undercurrent of how society treats the mentally ill, and was also a fan of Batman, this particular criticism of Batman frustrates me. It's perpetuation of specific idea in society that also often leads to interactions between of between people with disabilities and people and law enforcement going so badly. The idea that a person is mentally disabled and is acting abnormally, therefore they are going to act in a violent manner. And thus when they act in un when they act unpredictably, it is clearly going to be a violent response, a violent action, and thus a violent response is required, and this leads to people with autism and other disabilities besides getting shot by police, by the public. It sucks. It is terrible. It is nasty. And it is born out of societal bigotries regarding the regarding mental disabilities. So, of the characters we encounter in this storyline, including starting from this issue onwards, we're going to get into a couple of them later, four, I would say, fit the criteria of having some sort of diagnosable disability. Again, I am not a doctor. I do have autism, but again, not a doctor. But four would probably fit this criteria, would generally fit the criteria um, loosely, but even then, it's still a cinemat cinematized version of, these, of the symptoms of these disability of these disorders. There's Firefly with his pyromania, Ventriloquist and Two Face, who are generally depicted as some variation of dissociative uh, personality disorder, and Zaz, who is just generally universally depicted as a psychopath. Otherwise, a lot of these people are the like, villains. Starting with Matt Hatter with this in this issue, are villains with gimmicks. They are no more mentally unstable than Batrock the Leaper is on Marvel. Indeed, for the big two we'll be counting later, Joker and Scarecrow, the Joker has generally, before the, wait, before the killing joke, has been depicted as a colorful crook with a clown gimmick. This is going all the way back to the Golden Age, where the Joker was modeled after the main character of the film, The Man Who Laughs, um, and had a abnormally large grin, which probably was meant to have been expanded in a similar manner, much as, as we saw with Heath Ledger's depiction of the Joker in The Dark Knight. But, because it's com well, the comics code hadn't quite fully taken effect yet, but because of the nature of art and the time and various other issues, you probably couldn't get away with going that ham for the for the Joker. Scarecrow is a mad scientist with the sideline in psychology and psychopharmacology. He is a brilliant chemist who is obsessed with fear. Not and that's not a disability. That's not a mental disorder to be a obsessed with fear. And I use the term mad scientist in the colloquial sense, not again, not that he's diagnosed with he's diagnosable with anything, but the sense that he is an antagonistic figure in a work of fiction who uses science to a excessive degree, or to use the science for their own maniacal ends, I guess. Even then maniacal is even a bad term there too. Um, to put in context of another work of fiction, which I enjoy, in the sense of girl, in, to use the terminology from uh, the Foglio's Girl Genius, Scarecrow is a is a spark who is focused on chemistry, and again psychosarmacology and psychology. Now, Poison Ivy at this point had clearly been established in a miniseries by Neil Gaiman as having been experimented on by Jason Rudrew, the Thoronic Ran, giving her a connection to the Green and also to Swamp Thing. Which, in the, which, again, also expands to another point, 
we are in a world with the Swamp Thing, the anthropomorphic personification of the green, the collective consciousness of all plant life on Earth. You have Superman, an alien from another planet with powers above those of mortal men. You have Wonder Woman, who, depending on which iteration of her origin you have, is either a clay statue breathed to life by the goddesses of Mount Olympus to a child of Zeus. You have the Martian Manhunter, who is also an alien, who can shapeshift and phase, and so on and so on. In other words, you have a world full of costumed characters going on adventures and doing various things, and the Riddler, the Joker, the Scarecrow, the Mad Hatter, and others are just costumed criminals, in many respects falling in the same wake, in the same spirit as the heroes themselves. Not to say that the heroes are responsible for the existence of the villains, it, you could also just as easily take the tack of colorful criminals using... Um, costumes and so forth to make a name for themselves and the heroes taking on a similar tack to show that not everybody who wears a cape or wears a mask is a horrible person and that there are bright and colorful people out there who are out to help you too. So again, to sum up, arguably the reason that the Gar Arkham villains get sent there as opposed to Blackgate is because of societal bigotry attempting to rationalize this normal as insanity in spite of a plethora of other characters who are, aren't crazy who have similarly colorful gimmicks. Even just non, even just other costumed villains, whether you want to go with the flashes, um, Rogues Gallery with Captain Cold and all of them, Mirror Master, where you want to get into Malcolm Merlin and Green Arrow's Rogues Gallery. You want to get into the Shang, into your um, martial art, Richard Dragon and martial arts master territory with Lady Shiva, um, and so on and so forth. Now, admittedly, the reason this may happen to this degree for these villains going to Arkham instead of Blackgate, and also made a degree of regional bias as well. Super villains with gimmicks are normal for Metropolis because Metropolis is generally depicted as having a degree of weirdness. But people who act like that in Gotham are viewed as crazy and abnormal. So that's a possibility as well. We will revisit this last part when we get into the Bloodlines tie-ins, and we'll stick a pin in that. We'll get back to it later. All of that aside, I do like the visual here of Bane in his costume, sitting and watching TV in his hotel room, particularly with that cup of tea or coffee sitting next to him. Bane, drink your tea. It's getting cold. Yes, zombie. Getting back to the Hatter, Batman and Robin are heading to his party, with Robin getting instructions to be on backup only. At the party itself, the Hatter's first group of guests arrive, a group of Arkham escapees. The Hatter forces them at gunpoint to put on their hats, and then activates the mind control. Hatter gives the radio tracker to Film Freak, and sends him after Bird. He knows that whoever Bird is working for is playing them, and he doesn't like to be played. That's his job, thank you very much. Now, other than that, they just need to wait for their final guest. Batman. This whole bit in Brink shows how the Mad Hatter is a very underrated member of the Batman's rogues gallery. His first act, after being sprung by the clink, by, from the clink by an unknown person or persons that he, uh, as far as he's concerned anyway, is to recognize that whoever did this, did this for an ulterior motive, and that they do not like being used as a pawn. Again, that's his job. He treats other people like pawns, hence the mind control hats. And the other is for Hatter to put a heavily armed group together because he knows that because he's an Arkham escapee, or even if it was Blackgate for that matter, Batman will be coming after him. So he prepares a situation to fight Batman on his terms, not Batman's. Batman and Robin move in to take on the Hatter and his, um, cards? While Film Freak finds Bane's safe house, causing Bane to go step out to deal with him personally. As Batman and Robin fight Hatter and his cards, 
Bane fights Film Freak. Both Batman and Bane win their respective fights, with each side being able to hear the other through the radio link between the two. So, Bane hears Batman beat the Hatter, and Batman hears Bane kill Film Freak. Detective Comics 659 returns to the breakout from Arkham with some light comic relief as Maxi Zeus runs headlong into a tree and knocks himself out. He does the full George of the Jungle, too. Okay, Maxi Zeus probably is one of the, one of the ones who has a mental... The disability is the wrong term. Um, but, who is, but who is mentally divergent. I guess. In the midst of this, while turning a sock into a public puppet, a ventriloquist runs into Amygdala, who he tentatively teams up with. Meanwhile, Batman and Robin find the aftermath of Bane's fight with Film Freak. Bane has beaten Film Freak to death, and at the revolution, revelation, uh, rather, Robin may need to find a convenient garbage can to cast color spray from uh, into, just with the, with the oral component. The dynamic duo clears out before the police shows up, and this time it's not Bullock and Montoya responding, it's Detective, it's Lieutenant Kitsch, who I don't believe we've met before, at least in these comics. Uh, he has appeared in the uh, Etrigan the Demon comics, but not in the Bat books much as yet. Speaking of which, of colorful characters hanging around Gotham, um, Etrigan is also apparent, and, and Jason Blood are apparently based out of Gotham at this point, and also are Sir not showing up in this comic at all? Slightly weird. Anyway, he takes a couple of unnamed squaddies to task for being cavalier about the dead. We return to Dr. Flanders, and we get his first name, which I mentioned earlier is, is Simpson, and where he continues his spiel about the escaped Arkham inmates, and we also learned that he's previously worked at Arkham. I'm not going to cover every subsequent appearance, but Flanders pretty much shows up for each of the next few issues, generally doing the same shtick until he doesn't, so I'll cover when things change. The Ventriloquist goes into a tough guy bar looking for a Scarface. He's laughed at, so Ventriloquist calls in Amygdala. And after the bar is thoroughly annihilated, Ventriloquist realizes this whole sock puppet shtick isn't really working for him, and he's going to have to find something else. In the Batmobile, Robin is concerned about Batman's health, and discusses Bane while listening to the police scanner looking for calls that are related to Arkham escapees, and they hear a call about a break-in at a toy store. At that toy store, Ventriloquist is really bummed by the puppet selection. Batman and Robin arrive, and... Right at the same time, Robin sees Bird's Falcon, and goes to check that out. Meanwhile, Batman goes in and manages to get blindsided by Amygdala. On the outside, Robin confronts Bird, which leads to some great double "oh crap" looks from both parties. Batman manages to take down Amygdala, while Bird gets Robin on the ropes before Bane calls him off. After the fight, Ventriloga slips away, and Robin goes in pursuit of Bird. Batman has no time to catch his breath, though, as Zaz is holed up in the Bates School for Women, and he has hostages. Batman 493 opens with Batman racing for the Bates School for Women with a pronounced sense of dread. At the school, Zaz is menacing his hostages in the library. Zaz had previously appeared wearing a big, elaborate, dapper costume with a top hat and a bunch of other stuff, but here he's just kind of wearing his skivvies with his marks and with his uh, tally marks in full display. Outside, Lieutenant Kitch is leading the police response. They have some intel, 15 hostages, all of whom have been herded into the library. One guy, Axton, had been sent in, but hasn't reported back. Also, he wasn't sent in with a radio that had a headset. Someone who does have a radio with a headset volunteers to go in. The SWAT guy goes in and finds Axton with his throat slit. He cries out in shock, which alerts Zaz, who then kills the SWAT guy. The scene is really effective, particularly with the panel layouts. And here and later on in the issue, Brayfogle uses felt-tipped pins on the panel borders to tremendous effect. 
Byrne is monitoring the situation and suspects that Batman may actually be ready to take down, but Bane wants to wait and let the plan fully play through to its conclusion. Feeling that the Bat is physically weakened, but not emotionally weakened. When Toy and Bullock show up, Gordon is stuck with Mayor Kroll, who is on the brink of firing him. And they arrive just in time for Zaz to throw the two dead police out a window and say he's going to kill two hostages. And with that, Batman moves in. Bullock goes to make a comment to Montoya, but she's not there. In the school, Batman runs into Robin, who brings him up to speed with his encounter with Bird. Batman gives him the okay to tail Bird, but leave Bane alone. In the library, Zaz goes to kill two girls. When Montoya comes in, and when she can't get a clear shot, offers to switch places with the hostage. Zaz goes to then kill her when interrupting Batman. Zaz holds a knife to Bentoya's throat, but Batman keeps him talking long enough that Montoya breaks free, allowing Batman to go after Zaz, and he's able to take him down, though he nearly beats Zaz to death. On the roof, Batman takes a breather, while Bird reports on how just exhausted he looks. These three issues do a really, really good job of setting up how Bane basically intends his plan to work. It lays the groundwork for what what is going to come over the rest of what is going to be the first half of this event. Rather, this first half of this chapter of this event, I should say. Batman gets run, according to Bane's plan, run through a gauntlet of his various rogues, burning through his mental and physical resources. On its own, if we hadn't gotten all the build-up before this, showing that Bruce is very much on his last legs at the end of his rope psychologically, this would be a brilliant plan. But now, however, with this earlier knowledge, we now know coming into this that Bruce is already in a bad way. And so we have the added tension going into the story of Bruce is already mentally in a tight spot. He, there's the real question of can he withstand a fight with Bane on his own uh, without having to fight all these guys beforehand. And now all of Arkham is unleashed on the city. And what does that mean from there? And we will expand on this further in future, in our next installment. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.